it is in the middle. Checks back against Carter and scores. That is a typical for the Amina Margot. Mark quickly gets it back again. Oh, what a goal! Well, that sums up her season. Welcome back to another Vic Acres Wonderland podcast. I am joined by Lottie. How are you? I'm good. I am angry. I'm sad. And I'm just, I don't know how I feel. So I'm not good. Um, Had a really good weekend. Got my hair cut. Bobbing along. Get a notification this morning. Oh yeah. I don't know how I feel right now. And as always, also joined with us is Adam. How are you? Same as Lottie, really. Um, I I had sort of mentally prepared myself for this moment, um, but nothing really can prepare you for for this moment. It's it's. I think it's something we always knew would happen, and um, but it, it's happened now. And um, I think, as we said today, everybody is. Um, it's it's been a bitter pill to take it's been a blow and i think we're all still recovering from it and the reason why we're doing this podcast is because of that news every arsenal fan is out there probably crying their eyes out there's been a lot a lot of tributes to vivian anna margarita marina astrid miedema uh the news is that she is officially leaving at the end of the season so it's not just frank kirby leaving chelsea or the emma hayes of or mayo mauser there is going to be some sad tears at meadow park as well with a chance to say goodbye to one of the hottest strikers in wsl history and um, what is the mark that she's made on for the both of you uh j- just for me she was one of those players that I always look at and go, she is very much the professional and she's very tactical. She's very aware of what she needs to do. And she brought that with her. To me, she was always the, I, I really want to put it up there as the Dennis Ber- Bergkamp of that team mm. because of how how good she was. Do you know what? I'm really glad you said that because I've got a picture of that famous Newcastle angle from Dennis Burkham. And right next to him on the wall, I've got Vivian Miedemar against Birmingham City with the same angle. Like she she is the female Dennis Burkham to many of us. And I think for me, it's the fierce independence I'm going to miss because she wasn't one to celebrate her goals, apart from her Liverpool for one this season. But that was a, there was a major reason for that. But it was it was always about the team not just her and I think that's something I will miss I I, I agree with Lottie I think it's incredible that a player who has scored so many goals and fans nowadays think of Bunny Shaw and Sam Kerr um, uh, Rachel Daly obviously got the golden boot the previous season think of them as really good strikers fans who weren't here, say, pre-Euros, um, won't appreciate that Vivian Miedemar was arguably one of, if not the greatest forwards ever to play in the WSL. In, in the seasons when she was at her prime, and to witness that is incredible, was incredible. For those of you l- us lucky enough to be there, to see her play her game, t- for her to score so many goals, but also provide so many assists as well, that she was almost every player in the team. She was the scorer, she was the playmaker, she was the winger. She was everywhere in the attack, but it was never about her. It was always about the team. It was all about setting up her teammates. Um, Just one of the few players that could, could play the nine and the 10 at the same time, and it not be a detriment to the team. 
at the time when she was her prime, that was the case. Um, we may get onto how that panned out in later seasons, but certainly if you think 2018 to about 2020, that Vivian Miedemar was unstoppable. And I, I, it, it was just a joy to watch. And we were lucky to have her for those years. Um, and it's sort of what makes this moment even more painful. Just, rem just remembering the, the, the contributions she made in every game, because she played every game. The contributions she made, the vital contributions she made in every game to help Arsenal win, whether it's a pass through to Jordan Nobbs or, or a cutback to Van der Donk or decking five players against Liverpool and dinking it over the keeper, scoring hat tricks, scoring double hat tricks, winning cup finals, just the finest forwards Arsenal women, yeah, the finest forward we have ever had. And there have been some really good forwards, but I would say it's as it seems stand the far yeah the best striker we've ever had so just before we're going to go on to the seasons and how she did each season just to sort of get the idea of how how important she was for arsenal throughout the years there are moments and memories that you have of her i just only want one from each of you for me just personally one of my favorite ones has to be against tottenham north london derby at the hive Earlier on, on in the game, Jordan Nobbs has scored, but the referees disallowed that. Last minute, Vivian Medium goes up, goes and scores a header. First thing she does, head on the hands, focus. We got to go and make sure that we see this game out now. I actually so remember watch. watching that game over Skype with you guys. Well, I think it was it was, it was me and Matt. And yeah, I was at the was game. Just, I was there. Yes, you was you was. But that was the first inkling we were actually going to lose to Spurs, and that was a warning shot. And Look what's happened following yeah. the following years. Um, I think for me, it's 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 got to be that 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 game when we were sitting on club level, Adam and the Vivian Vivian Meadmars defending off the line. That <laughs> I think yeah. it was it against Spurs. It was against Spurs, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, and Spurs it's, 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 it's just completely out of place, and it's just like, hang on a minute, what the hell's going on here? And then there's also the other obvious choice, the season after. Uh, we were then sitting in the low, lower tier, and she she scored against Spurs, mm. and it was just one of the greatest goals I've ever seen. I said earlier she could play anywhere on the pitch, the nine, the ten, the winger. We found against Spurs she could play goalkeeper as well. Um, there was no position Miedemar could not play in this team. Um, it's really difficult for me because I had an overabundance. There are so there, she supplied so many memories. It's impossible. It's so hard to pick one. But I think I'm going to go for her final goal as things stand. She may score, obviously, against Brighton. I am kind of jealous that only, you guys saw that. I'm so jealous. And and only because it's because I, I enjoyed so many moments of watching Miedemar, most of them on the TV, um, more recently in the grounds. But for that moment, I was sat right behind the goal and watched that ball fly off Miedemar's foot and sail into that corner. And it's one of those moments when you know she scored before the goalkeeper has made the dive. You just know that it's that homing missile has found the back of the net. And the roar in the stands celebrating, it's Miedemar's comeback goal. And that, that way that she's finally she's finally scored after the, the hell that she's been through the ACL. And to be there, be in the crowd, the away fans were rocking. And to be behind that moment, in that moment, that, that, will, that will stay with me forever. Well, I'm sure we'll go on to a few more memories that we all have. So we'll go into the first season that she was with the club. From In 2017-2018, she signed away from Bayern at Munich. Uh, in that season, Arsenal finished third in the WSL. They were runners-up in the FA Cup, but the most important thing was that she got the winner against Chelsea in the Man City, Conti Man City. Cup. Man City in the Conti Cup. It was Chelsea in the FA Cup. I did. I knew I was. I, was all right, I knew I should have put the teams in. Wrong way around. I was always going to mess up. It was a 50-50. It's a 50-50 chance. That is true. Just so, just that season, first one under the belt, winning, scoring the winner against Man City, mm. and she got. She only got eight goals that season. Yeah. So, twenty-seven eighty is a bit of an interesting one. So Arsenal started that season with uh, I think it's Pedro Martinez. 
Um, he won the FA Cup and the Conti Cup in his previous season. Still the last Arsenal manager to win the FA Cup, should be said. He had the Spring Series. That was like a sort of a half tournament because originally uh, seasons were played during the off season, the men's side. So it was just, it would be, I think it was like sort of March through to sort of October sort of time period. And they wanted to align that with the men's side. So you had the Spring Series, which was just a little mini tournament to swing the calendar around. And Arsenal came, I think, third in that season. They were unbeaten, but their real struggle was goals. They, re- they had some silly nil-nil draws against, like, Sunderland, and they should have really scored. And they had, like, Joe, no offence to Joe Taylor, legend, legend, obviously, as we all know, but they had, like, Jody Taylor leading the line, Dan Carter leading the line. They needed a striker to really improve in front of goal. And so, 2017, they signed with the leader, Martha, Bayern Munich. Been doing great things at Bayern Munich. Just won the Euros for the Netherlands, it should be said. Scored against England in the semi-final with a very nice header. But I think she I, she wasn't really used much. And I think she struggled a bit with fitness when she first arrived. It's fascinating to, to watch. We spoke in an early part about when we lost 5-2 at Man City. Jodie Taylor led the line from the start. Miedemar was on the bench. Now, if you think about that now, that would be madness. But that's the way the team was. And Pedro wasn't long for the game. He was uh, he, he uh, was moved on after a one-all draw against Bristol. Joe Montemurro came comes in. Now... People have very various views about Joe Montemurro, about his time at Arsenal. It can be of no doubt that he got the best out of Vivian Miedemar. He, he had obviously spotted straight from the off, this is my striker. You are the one that's going to win us the trophies and everything's going to go through you. Um, she's got, I think, a first goal against Everton in typical Miedemar fashion, some tricky on the edge of the box, and then picks out the top corner. Um, scored against Chelsea, actually, in, at uh, Kings Meadow. Um, didn't score as many goals as we'd hoped. Again, I think there were some fitness issues in their first season, but did score critical goals. None more so, as you say, in the Conti Cup final against Man City. That eclipsed during the round. I do look out for it. It's a fine goal and gave Arsenal a trophy. Um, first trophy since the FA Cup. And it was, if we did finish third in the end, Arsenal went on a fantastic run of form. Sort of Gareth Taylor-esque, really, just sort of loads and loads of wins. But their poor form at the start of the season under Pedro meant they were always chasing and eventually they ran out of steam. That lost, dropped some silly points to Yeovil and Birmingham and they missed out on the top two because back then top two was Champions League, not top three. I think they missed out by like a point and they fell short. But Miedemar, she hadn't exploded onto the scene, but she was about to. I think she scored in that other game, the FA Cup final against Chelsea. Um, I believe that was the last goal she scored in the cup final for Arsenal. She only got two, and they were both in that season, sadly. Arsenal didn't win the FA Cup final, they lost to Chelsea. But you watch those games back, you can just see the first sort of, the early the early murmurs of the medium are still about to happen. Interestingly, she actually took a penalty in that season, uh, I think against Liverpool as well. Well, if it's the only time she's taken a penalty for Arsenal. Uh, she didn't score it, obviously, but she scored the rebound. And that's why she will always remain, unless, she, unless something happens It's Brighton, Another reason, an incredible striker has never scored a penalty for Arsenal. It, it's certainly in, in excluding shootouts. And I think that just makes her legacy even more incredible. Let's go on to the 2018, uh, sorry, yeah, 2018 to the 2019 season. This time she was in the full swing, scoring 31 goals that season. You look at how the team did as well. They went on to win the WSL that season. However, they went out of the fifth round in the FA Cup. They lost the Conti Cup on penalties to Man City as well. And again, no Champions League. But to win the WSL second season and then carrying on that silverware, that was something to be gained. I remember seeing Arsenal post about Arsenal potentially winning the league over at Brighton's stadium, that's the yeah. Amex. And I kind of wish I would have gone at that time just to see how it would have gone, because I think I would have probably been on board a lot sooner and I would have probably gone to a lot more of those games as well. Um, Just on that season as a whole, the fact that she scored 31 goals is pretty uh, pretty amazing by today's standard. You look at someone like Bunny Shaw, Rachel Daly, both only just got under that 22 in the WSL, if you don't count the Cups. So I I imagine that's about... You're probably yeah. looking at maybe 25, 26 goals that she scored. Actually, no, she I, she still holds that record, doesn't she? 22 yeah. goals is the most she scored in the WSL season. So I think the 2018-19 season for Arsenal is, is revered so much, and rightly so, but it's also a fascinating point in time 
that Arsenal brilliantly exploited. And Vivian Miedemark was key to that. It should be said they won all but two games that season. Uh, they lost two defeats, the rest were wins. It should also be said the league, the amount of teams in the league was one fewer. They were still growing the game. So I think it, it, I think it was twenty. I think it was a twenty-one team league. I'll just do a quick uh, tally check. Yeah, eleven team. So um, twenty. Uh, probably it's twenty matches or so in the season. So eleven team league rather than twelve we have now. And you look at the league that season and the quality in the league or lack of. We had in there Yeovil, who obviously since um, disappeared, I think completely, or were relegated that season. They finished bottom. Birmingham, who have since been relegated. Reading, who have since been relegated. Bristol City, who have been relegated, come back and relegated again. Liverpool, who also uh, relegated, have since come back and doing quite well this season. The league then was not the league we have now. And Vivian Miedemark was too good for the league and just ran havoc. We were also blessed with Chelsea having probably their worst ever start to the season, which really helped us because it meant that we were able to build up such an impressive lead. By the time they got the right together, we were over the hills. In fact, Chelsea finished third that season didn't, and didn't even get into Europe. But you watch the games back, and if you can find clips of the games, especially Arsenal start of the season, Arsenal were playing the likes of uh, Daniela van der Donk, Jordan Nobbs, uh, Beth Mead behind Vivian Miedemar, and they just tore teams apart. And I'm not joking, five ones, against um, uh, Liverpool on the opening day, meet my hat trick. Um, I think they were f- oh five, sorry, five nil, so not five one. That was uh, that was the game there for season. So five nil opening game, Meadow Park. Meet my scores a hat trick. Um, I think she got maybe goals against Reading. I think it was like six against Reading, four one against Brighton. The goal, the game, ever remembers the five nil away at Chelsea. Meet gets two of those, and uh, Jordan Nobbs gets the other two. <clears throat> Until Jordan Nobbs sadly does a race against Everton. This is the most beautiful, brilliant, attacking Arsenal side I I sadly never got to see because by the time I was on board, the season was sort of almost over. I've had to since go re-experience this by finding the footage and watching it back. But you watch this, the Arsenal team, and they are on a level above everyone. We didn't play Man City, uh, Man City until Christmas time, by which time we'd won all our games. And you just thought, this is a team that is just going to run forever and Miedem was, was key to that setting up Nob, setting up Van der Donk, Kim Little and Volti anchoring the midfield like they've done all, all ever since and you really appreciate just what a talent she was that it was so she was so um I can't say emotionless but it was just so routine for her it was so easy for her she could leave players on the deck with her movement she was always timing her runs correctly in the box she spoke since that season everything she touched hit the back of the net. Just an incredible run of form for such a striker. And this was her sort of awakening, her moment with her, when she truly arrived in the WSL. Um, Arsenal went on to, once he lost to Chelsea at the turn of the year, they just won every game. Just won through every game. 5-1 away at Liverpool, 3-0 away at Reading, um, 2-1 at home to Everton, and then, of course, the Brighton game, which was just an exhibition in the way Arsenal play football, playing it the right way, the Arsenal way. And uh, Miedemar opens the scoring with an absolute cracker from the edge of the box, in off the crossbar, gets Arsenal the early goal, and it's a procession after that. Katie McKay, Beth Mead with a screamer, Daniela van der Donk. And it was just, you thought, Arsenal are back. This was their first WSL title since 2012. And you just felt this was finally the Arsenal we've been waiting for. They were back. We got the an amazing team of forwards that are just going to steamroller the, the double set for generations. Um, it was a beautiful moment in time. Um, and like Matt, I just wish I could have been there to support them. But it's that season that drove me back to the Arsenal women. Um, well, I say back as in drove me to go to the games, watch them, commit to watching them. It not, not just be look at the results, actually go to the games, watch the games on TV, try and watch the games on TV. Thankfully, the FA player came out the next season, which we'll get to. But that season was the inspiration for me to follow the Arsenal women, go to the games and, and join you guys and talk with this podcast as we're doing now. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Vivian Miedemar and the contributions she gave that season. I do think, we'll get on to more in a minute, she, the reverence 
that everyone has for Vivian Miedema is in part down to that season and some of the seasons that followed. I don't think we've ever seen Vivian Miedema play like that at that level since. But I think a lot of fans hope that we can. And I think that is partly to how things have sadly played out today. Some of the, the, the love, and she is loved, and we'll get on to her in a minute by the fans. And I do wish we could have had one more season of that. Um, that Vivian Miedema, because when she was like that, unstoppable. Nobody, nobody could stop her. Just on this, Lossie, again, we've all sort of come into this a little bit late towards Viv's last couple of years at the club. So when you're hearing people go back and watching some of these clips, I mean, Arsenal actually still got the 100, uh, Vivian uh, Miedema 100 goals uh, compilation still on YouTube. So there are things that you can go back and watch. Is that something that you could go and think about doing maybe on your lunches and things like that? Yeah, and the thing is, at the moment, I'm I'm actually addicted to one of one of my panelists, other accounts, and uh, called the and and their other Twitter account, the A A W U A W Archive. Oh, uh, AWR, the, the, that's it. Do you know what it is? I don't have to search it. I've got the notification bell on, so I just press the tweet, <laughs> yeah. I, and I don't have to look it up. But it's. It just gives me a, a glimpse into what I've actually missed out on, and I'll be. I'll, I it's it's the, those all those. Um, I can't say the word. What was the word, Matt? That you just used? I can't say. It. I end up stuttering on it. Highlights, clips. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Comps. And yeah. Comps. Yeah. It. I I end up watching all that kind of stuff just just to kind of catch up. When I first started watching, I remember the men. We lost to Brentford on the Friday night. We got our butts handed to us, and um by Man City in the next game and that's when yeah. I really started watching and then obviously we kind of started interacting and we, we've just been friends since Yeah, and it's I'm kind of disappointed I've missed out on Viv but I did get a whole season out of her and she's the one player that I got really excited to see every time and it, it was the, she was at the beginning she was the main reason why I was watching her move her movement her, her just her tactical brain and how everything, how she put everything into the team is is why I've started watching the Arsenal women. And it was so much. I was all I was seeing is is just as I said earlier, the female Dennis Burkham. And I I can watch comps of Dennis Burkham for hours and not be bored. And I could probably do the same for Viv. I really like your comparison, Lottie, with Burkamp because that applies so much to me, but for different reasons. Okay, and go that's on. because I. I never got to properly see Burt Cat play, much yeah, like you know never got to see Miedema play. Me, for me, um, it was my first hybrid game. Um, I had yeah. seats in the West Ham with my little brother and my dad. And I remember the ball coming over and I threw the ball back to Dennis. And it's just like, oh my God, it's something oh. that's so massive. I always treasure. I remember the ball came back before and my dad had sort of caught it from my brother. My brother's about six at the time. He refused to give the ball back to Thierry Henry. And I think that's just one of my greatest memories. Like that to happen in like 90 minutes, it's... And like being one of the first games at hybrid, it's just it's something that you just hold on to. Um yeah. it's a bit like the first couple of games that I went to with you guys live, I was like, if they don't score, I'm not coming again. And then obviously <laughs> not a squad, and that was it. And yeah. I I've I've been back nearly every game possible. I, I, so I I came into the Arsenal men late and the first sort of proper season where I I was sort of it took me a while to get to speak with seasons and how they work and when to follow the games and how to follow them and how to watch them. And by the time I was fully up to speed, it was Dennis Burkamp's um, testimonial at Emirates Stadium. And people revere Burkamp as this incredible player, play for Arsenal with his touches, his passing, his goals. And that those those are just words to me because I have no emotional attachment to what people say is one of the finest players talented players you've ever had at Arsenal and that that pains me that I missed that boat and I'm you with me Mark I, I did so well I didn't you that's the first time I will get to I I, I saw, again I just missed that I did see a lot of great Viv we'll, we'll talk about her future seasons but this season again I wasn't fully up to speed with women's football I wasn't fully up to speed of how I watch it how I follow it going to the games and by the time I was I'd missed probably the greatest ever season by an individual striker, play for Arsenal and women's RBSL. Um and, and that will haunt me. And and that's on me because I, I didn't tune in in time. And um, yeah, well, well, we should get on to how her following seasons went. 
just on that as well, because I think you've touched on a point on the bubble with Bergkamp. We're going to keep on making these references, aren't we? Mm. I don't know why, but every time I used to go, I don't know, I used to put YouTube on, and Dennis Bergkamp would be one of those players in those in that top two or three players that I'll be watching, because it was just one of those people that you could just keep on watching and really enjoy. Yeah, it was like watching magic, and it's, it just makes you feel excited. I get the same feeling, feel like, feeling? feeling with Vivian Miedemar, and it's just... It's just unreal, and it's it's a, a pair of them. Are dead. Yes, it's two different eras, two different ball games, but mm. the technicalities of what they do and the specialisms, it's just, oh, they're just, it's beautiful. Poetry in motion. Well, hopefully it's the lo- not the last time that we see her in an Arsenal shirt, and the only reason I'm saying that is potentially there might be a, tr- a we, well, testimonies have gone out the window in the past, but hopefully we might see one return back soon. Should there be a retirement for an Arsenal player? Fingers yeah. crossed. Um, 2019 2020, Arsenal was out on the Champions League by four points. They lost the semi finals of the FA Cup to Man City, and then to make it even worse, losing to Chelsea in the Conti Cup final. Yeah. So this season, well, we went into the season as holders. Uh, we were off the back of a of an incredible World Cup in France. Um, Miedemar had helped take the Netherlands to the final. Um, we had sadly lost the semi-final to the USA. And I went to my torture. first... It was torture, but we, we, we will gloss over that. I went to my first Arsenal women's game that season. Well, I went to the Emirates Cup at Emirates Stadium. It was a game they had against Bayern Munich. Yes, so I and, Yes, yeah, and I got to have a bit to take the trophy and met the players and didn't know any of their names and felt very embarrassed. It sort of made me think, right, I need to knuckle down and learn this team. Now, Miedema was a player I did know and had hoped to see, and sadly, she didn't play in the Emirates Cup. She was still recovering from the World Cup. She came in for the season later. And that season, it was, uh, we were we invested in the team again. We brought a new goalkeeper in Mosinsberg, and we brought the likes of Jewel Rod in, brought Jen Beattie back. From Man City to bring him into the fence. And I said in the previous season, is this the team that is going to continue on this momentum and win WSLs like Chelsea had done in previous seasons? And the answer was no. And sadly, this was sort of the moment when the tide turned against Joe Montemuro and against um, against Arsenal. The, the previous season, as like I said, they won all but two games. It's the high, it remains still the highest points percentage achieved in a WSL season ever. No one's achieved, yeah, they, they dropped six points out of how many possible. No one's ever achieved that many percentages of points. And I say percentages because the amount of games in WSL is varying. We've gone from so little teams to so many now. But that season, Vivian Miedemar looked to be at her best, um, scored against Liverpool, scored against Man City at Meadow Park. Um, looked like it was a continuation of the norm, but we lost away at Kings Meadow. Again, play, we won last season, so that previous season so convincingly, we lost there. And then we lost it at Meadow Park, 4-1. We were absolutely trounced. Me and I played that game, but our setup was wrong. And Chelsea out-muscled us, out-fought us, and the flaws of Joe Montemurro's side, the, the cracks started to appear. Because as great as we were with our rotational forwards, Nobbs was just starting to come back from her ACL injury. Um, we had Jill Rawd as well as another talent. But Joe Montemiro was trying to cobble all these together at once and there was no structure in the team. There was no defensive solidity. It was all about attacking, but there was never anything about how to defend as well. And Chelsea tore us to pieces. Man City won away at, um, um, at, at, at the academy stadium, as it was known then. To pretty much seal the deal. Um, we had the Conti Cup final, as you say, and um, sadly lost that right at the death. The FA Cup happened actually because of lockdown, it happened the following season, but then lockdown happened. The mm-hmm. season ended and we lost we lost some points per game. One might think that had the season been able to continue and had we played those remaining games, there's a chance that Man City or Chelsea could have dropped the points and maybe we could have made up and maybe at least got second place because, again, there was no third place for Europe back then. But that was the moment that things started to turn for Arsenal. Um, and it became more and more evident that we were becoming more and more reliant on Vivian Miedemar to win. She was playing every single game. And we talk so much more now about load, 
about the ACL problem, <coughs> the ACL pandemic, rather that's, that's affecting everyone, has since claimed Vivian Miedema. And she was happy to play every game because simply because we wouldn't win otherwise. We couldn't risk not playing her. In the opening game of the season, we only beat West Ham 2-1. We had to hang on at the end. Vivian Miedema was left up the team. Again, she was recovering from the World Cup. We were having to win the game without her and we struggled. It wasn't the dominant win that maybe one would expect of us. And I think this is where, and I've spoken before about single points of failures, that no team should be over-reliant on an individual. In the previous season, Miedema was complemented by the players that around her. But going to this season, Ward was struggling to settle. Jordan Hudson was struggling to come back from the ACL. She wasn't the sharp player that she once was. Um, and there just said to be a sort of general sense of confusion about how it all cobbled together. And it, so it became a default rely on Miedema. And she still had great moments. The trip, the double hat-trick she scored against Bristol City will go down in history. The 11-1 thrashing of Bristol City remains the record goal um, scoreline in a WSL match. And Miedema, again, scored six goals and assisted four. And I think she came off to like, off like 67 minutes with the scores at 10-0. Just, we've never seen anything like that ever since. But I, as I said before, the league has improved. And um, we'll maybe get on to the future seasons. I don't believe we'll have a score like that ever again because I think the, the golf in class quality is closed. But we were just sort of seeing then Arsenal shift to more relying on Miedema rather than um, sort of working with her, shall we say. Uh, and that sort of fed into the following season. 29 goals she scored in the 1920 season. Yeah. The 2020 2021 season, and she scored 25 goals in that. Jonas, uh, no, sorry, not this before Jonas comes in. Joe Montemuro, yeah. <laughs> Joe Montemuro's last year in charge. This is a difficult one because I do remember this this being a bit of an odd, odd one because I remember, Ars- I don't know how, but Arsenal weren't streaming the a PSG game in the Champions League and it was a very very bizarre one because I, I think they lost it 2-1 and it was just like yeah. what's going on why aren't they going forward they're not attacking it all of a sudden they're too deep and letting PSG come on to them but just quickly before that they, they qualified for the Champ- uh, Champions League and being third place the first time that the Champions League yeah. expanded into the group stage as it now is which will then be changed further down in the years. Yeah. They lost the FA Cup uh, in the final, but that was the following season because of COVID. Yeah. And yeah. they also lost the Conti Cup to Chelsea. Yes, uh, we should. So, the, so just quickly. So oh, sorry. No, so we sorry, have... I'm getting this wrong. They got they knocked out on points, points per game. That's what I was meant yeah. to say. I was looking at the wrong <laughs> <laughs> so we should just actually clarify so we didn't we neglected to mention it in, in the previous season but that previous season because us from the league they actually qualified for the champions league and vivian Miedemark for the early rounds tore teams to pieces uh fiorentina slavi praha swept away um Miedema, i think got, scored four goals i think over in in, in prague and then may even got a hat and then i think van don got a hat trick and i think Miedema did as well she was the top scorer or joint top scorer, I think, in the end, for that campaign. Arsenal only made to the quarterfinals, as you say, lost to PSG. But she she met, left her mark on Europe. She she left that um, campaign with the golden boot. Um, and again, one of the great tragedies is we never got to see Miedemar exert that dominance again in Europe, just in the way that the, the dice uh, fell, in my opinion. This season was the end for, for Joe Montemuro. He's, he's t- he had one way of playing. This this beautiful attacking way of playing, but more and more teams have figured him out, and the quality was was closing on him. Manchester United were growing; they were a real threat. Um, they they lost to them. Um, they won the first five games, and it looked like the same sort of Arsenal. Miedemar getting a hat trick against Spurs. Arsenal beating Reading six one. Just the same. All right, we got the goals are flowing. Uh, we won. We, we won. 9-1 at West Ham and Miedemar was again amongst the goals, edge of the box, setting up players. The Arsenal that was winning perhaps 2018-19, but again against the bigger teams, 
they struggled and they didn't have the advantage of having fans in the ground because this was lockdown. This was a season behind closed doors. There were no fans supporting them. There was no chance. Arsenal lost away at Man United. They drew late on at home to Chelsea, a game they should have won. And then they lost in added time, hanging on by the end, away at Manchester City. And this was all before Christmas. And any momentum, any hope that it started that season was just washed away as it became increasingly clear that Arsenal simply couldn't do it. They simply, the, the, Their other teams had moved on. Chelsea had Penilla Harder, Sam Kerr, and Frank Herbie in their front three, probably one of the finest front threes. We talk about Miedema being a great strike, individual striker, but that attack force Chelsea had was probably the best they've ever had under Emma Hayes. It's why they went so close to doing the quadruple that season. And you've watched in the second half of the season, drawing one all away at Reading. Joe Montemuro never, um, well, post-27-18, never lost to teams outside the top three. They were swept away, but he was dropping points against teams he shouldn't have been dropping points against. He was drawing away at Reading. He lost, again, away at Manchester United, although they were on their way up under Casey Stoney. And then he got back, he, well, he lost at home to Manchester City, a game where we were just outpaced, outmuscled. It really showed the divide that this team were calling. And unfortunately, Miedemar, her influence was wilting. In the away game, Man City, Miedemar, individual, brilliant, scored a great goal finish the box, but we couldn't sustain it. And there's only so much an individual can do to, to hold a team back against the rising tide. There's only so much that influence will break. And it became that season, we, I said, we lost at home to Man City. We got battered away at Chelsea. And the season became, we need to cling on to third place. And what started off as Miedemar leading a potential title charge was uh, Miedemar dragging us to third place. I don't know if any of you have seen that Simpsons episode when they all play, the kids, the children learn to play uh, American football. And there's a scene where Nelson is being, he's dragged, the opposition had clung onto him and he's literally dra being, dra he's dragging them because he's so strong. Yeah, he I've drags the ball over into the touchdown area. Yeah. And that was like that with Miedemar. She was, the whole team was on her back and she was having to get the team on her own back over that finish line and, and get Arsenal into that Champions League place. And it ends with obviously Kim Little scoring an inside penalty where Everton, Miedemar didn't get the golden boot that season. I believe it was Sam Kerr. Miedemar broke the record. She scored a hat against Spurs. She got, I think it was 50 WSL goals. But it was Sam Kerr that won the golden boot. I do love about her. She doesn't care about those accolades. She does no, not she doesn't. care. It's all about the team. And it's one thing I absolutely adore about her. I remember reading it at one point. I think it was in Tim Stillman's recent article. Um, she was talking about being being left out as a nominee for the Ballon d'Or one season. And she said, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I think, and I think she's from the worst stuff, effect, but <laughs> Yeah, but like, it's stuff like that. You just think, wow, what an incredible individual you are. Like, trophies don't mean anything her. to her. It's all about Indi well, individual, individual. Yeah, we can think of certain strikers. Individual trophies, but she yeah, obviously yeah. you prefer the, the team trophy, the team trophies. Yeah, but the individual accolades, she doesn't care. It's not a team no, effort. Think... She's always been the anti-star. Not although, as we see her as the star at this point, she's always had a yeah. sort of anti-star attitude. If that makes sense. She's had an incredible mentality, and we could think of another striker who whose sole purpose has been to just consistently mop up individual awards because that's the only trophy they've won. But my point about Sam Kerr winning the Golden Boot is that, for me, it signified the point that the um, that Vivian's sort of ability of being the best striker with WSL was under threat. And it was, I think it's, the, it, it's no, this is no fault of the player, this is no fault of anyone. It's just the natural course of events that you don't stay at the top forever. And Arsenal were changing. Joe Montemurra left at the end of the season. He, he, he'd taken the team as far as he could go. It was, it was abundantly clear. Um, he still remains the last Arsenal manager to win at the WSL. And we went on a different direction after that. And I think that, rightly or wrongly, changed Vivian Miedema, um in terms of her position in the team, which we'll get to. And the, the days of her free scoring, free assisting, setting up the team, the team setting up her, those days were over. See, I would probably say, I know this is a bit off topic, but I, I think Miedema is different 
kind of player to Sam Kerr. I see Sam Kerr as she thrives in a team of individuals, which is why she suits Chelsea. Whereas if Sam Kerr was to play for Arsenal, she wouldn't settle us or she wouldn't even get 10 goals for Arsenal, if I'm honest. Because it's all about her. Yeah. Whereas if you got Viv, who was trying to be his team player, she wants to set people up. She wants, she's that. I'd say second and third captain on on the uh, on the pitch. She don't she yeah. doesn't need an armband to tell people to move. I think one person has mentioned that during one game that uh, she shouted a lot about uh, to Beth about not being in position. Lisa Evans had to tell her to calm down. There, there was I've seen clips of her. There was a game. A Conti Cup game in that season, we lost 4 1 at Chelsea. It, it knocked us out off in the group stage. And I'm pretty sure there's a clip I've got of her shouting. You can hear the players shouting because there's no fans, but she's demanding more of the team, um, just bellowing at the team. She, because of the players she she plays at that time, she was playing at such a high level. And I said before, the WSL was too good for us, for, for her at the time. She was of a level of all the other teams. But now, Arsenal weren't at her level. They they couldn't they couldn't give Viv the platform that she needed to be the player she wanted to be. And the rest of the rest of the league but were starting you know, defensively. The, the league now, for example, is a much better team defensively than it was five years ago in terms of the way they are coached, in terms of where the low block is made. And that changes how a strike has to operate and a different type of striker strike has to operate. And you mentioned Sam Kerr. Sam Kerr flourished at Chelsea. She complimented, she, she was the perfect, once she got up to speed, she was the perfect striker for Chelsea because if they were struggling, they could just ping a long ball to Sam Kerr and she would finish it. She was that sort of player. Miedema wasn't that kind of striker. She was a different kind of striker. She was the perfect striker at the time when Arsenal needed her. But I think the game changed and Arsenal changed and Miedema didn't become that striker anymore. Well, this one we can all start talking about because this is the season that, as Lossie <laughs> mentioned a bit earlier on, we started talking a little bit more um, and we started to get together a bit to even podcast here and there. And this was the season that I think we all really enjoyed. Jonas Ardebell comes in and all of a sudden it's a different ball game. It's not the sluggish Arsenal that we've seen and saw in the last season of under Joe, it's more of a very fast pay, pace. Let's get this ball rolling, bring more of a team build up, and not just and just scoring different goals. Opening day of the season, uh, opening game against at, at the Emirates against Chelsea. You don't see many like that, but I kind of wish I was in the crowd. Adam, you were in the crowd that day. Lottie, had you were in the game was at the Emirates? Would you have gone to that game? Do you know what? I've watched that game over so many times. It's ridiculous. I'm quite excited I missed it. Um, it's a case of the amount of memes we've got out of that game is just unreal. I, I mean, Viv in general, with all her faces, her expressions and everything goes on, it's just she's just a meme factory. And I do, kind of going back to that game, I do kind of wish I watched it because I was going to, and then something held me up. I didn't go, and I was so annoyed. I thought, oh, do you know what? I want to check this out. It's an extra game of football. It's on my ticket. Might cheer me up before the next game. Um, but I'm just really disappointed. I didn't watch it. Really annoying. Oh, I did watch it. Um, and... I was there and it was the most nerve wracking game I've been to since probably the Conti <laughs> Cup final this season because I'd never seen us beat Chelsea. I never, I've, I've seen highlights of it, but I'd never been watching a game, women's team live in stadium or. Chelsea were like this, this, like this invincible boss batter that we had no means of getting past. So I sat in the crowd, roasting hot sun. Me, Demar opens the scoring. Well, this is fantastic. We scored early-ish. And then Cuthbert brings it level at half time. You roll your eyes. Same old Arsenal. Second half, Me, Demar picks up the ball. Centre of our half. Chelsea are pushing on, trying to get that win, trying to get the lead, to, that, you know, so they can take the lead. And she picks out a sumptuous through pass straight through the entire team. And Beth Mead is onto it, sprinting clear, sprints clear of the fence, takes it onto her left and hammers the ball past and catching Berger. It's, Beth, it's a brilliant goal from Beth Mead, but it comes from the vision of Vivian Miedemar that she has that in her locker. She has that pass in her locker. And it's not something Arsenal really 
delved into too much because she was always the number nine. She was the lead striker. She was scoring the goals. If she was assisting, another striker, another player, like um, she, often the assist would be very close, like a, like a, a pass in, in through or pass down the wing. But this was a pass from deep. Um, you, you would see her do it again later in the season as we get to. But it sort of hinted at maybe how Jonas might use her. Um, we should say 15 Minowa's career started as a number 10. She wasn't originally a striker, she was originally a 10. She became a striker at necessity, I think it was through her international setup. And then yeah. because she was so good, she was so good in the six up box, just as in everything she touched went into the net. She became a number nine and remains one of the finest number nines ever. And the game ended 3 2. It was about 30 minutes we had to hang on to and uh, a real nerve shredder. But it was just a wave of relief that we, this was a demon we had conquered, and it made me think, yeah, it was it was it was too early in the season to start saying, oh, but yeah, we, to make any title predictions. But it was like I've never been in this position before, following properly following Arsenal. What on earth is the future going to hold for us? And what's it going to hold for Vivian Miedemar? Are, are we seeing a new Miedemar? Is Jonas going to take us on to trophy? The season. Obviously, we're going to have panned out, but at the beginning, there was a real sense of after that game, that was like there was a real sort of wake up call that we could do something very, very special this season because we've just gone and beaten the reigning champions who had won the treble the previous season and got to a Champions League final. And we've beaten them 3 2 at Emirates Stadium. You know, first game with the WSL. We think, wow, this is good. This is going to be an incredible season. It's also the first game that was shown on Sky Sports. Yes, oh, no. Oh, no, it wasn't, no. no, it wasn't because they had the not? Friday game. No, because a um, bit of dirty trivia. They ha- they did the Man United game at uh, LSV on your batch is called a screamer. And they, I think it was against Reading. They won it 2 0, and it was like a Friday night game. And then they did the Sunday game um, at, at Meadow Park, at um, Emirates Stadium, rather. Still, there was still a bit of sort of COVID rules around that at the time, I think. It was still a bit of, we were just coming out of lockdown at that time. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was it was the big Sky game of the weekend, and it sort of made it even more special the occasion. And at the time, eight thousand pounds that was like a record. I think it was a record attendance, which is even more incredible when you get to the statistics now. But it was such a perfect day, and Miedemar was the heart of that of that day. So just to break down this season, second in the league, an FA Cup semi final against Chelsea, uh, Champions League quarter final loss to Wolfsburg. And losing to Man United in the quarterfinals of the uh, the Conti Cup, twenty five goals she scored that season. But there are, I think, everyone's got their own favourite memories of this season. And for me, I always think about uh, the goal that she scored against Man United at Lay Sports Village. That'll be probably one of my favourites. <laughs> um, basically, she just picks the ball up and she's she's uh, she's running on. And for whatever reason, Mary Earps cannot see anything. She hasn't got a cap on it. And it was one of those things that made me wonder, why don't you have a cap on? It's sunny. You can't see anything. So when uh, I think it's just before the uh, the penalty area, she takes a, takes a shot, must have been about 30 odd yards out. And she hits it right in the bottom corner. But Mary Earps gone the opposite way, trying to bar the cut post and trying to save yeah. it. I think it's, no, it's, that do you know what I done. forgot about that one that kind of has put a smile on my face. It's it's one of them ones where you think, do you know what you can put like a pair of sun I don't know, some sort of eye protection to so you can see what you're doing. Mm. And it, I think it's just one of the most comical attempts to save a vivid media martial art. It was a really weird one, but it was also just for us, from an Arsenal point of view, it was absolutely hilarious. I think it also reflects the intelligence of Miedemar to see that Mary Epps got a position wrong. And it's the quick, quick thinking, thinking, right, I can get her here. She, she's made a mistake here. And it's the alertness and, and to execute the shot perfectly. Brilliant from her. My favourite Miedemar moment from that season, I don't know if you've got one, Lottie, but my favourite one was also against Manchester United. But it was at home and it wasn't a goal, but it was the assist for Stina Blackstone's first goal for Arsenal. It is one of the greatest passes you will ever see. It's just un- that was world. in her video, yeah. was in her leaving video, wasn't it? Oh, that was sublime. The it was a game that, that it was ultimately one of the games that crossed Arsenal the league that season. Sadly, we dropped points. We, it was a game we had to win. We were down to ten players, and we conceded an early goal from the corner. It was a late equaliser that saved the game, if not the season. But Miedemar from nowhere 
from the edge of their own box, plays a pass that takes out the entire Manchester United team and Steenis runs clean through to score past Earps. It's a pass I don't even know how she finds. That's but, the magic uh, of Vivian Miedemar. It is. It's that football IQ, isn't it? You can't teach that. No, no you, can't. you can't. And there's some great other goals that season with some of her tricking as the box and passes through to players so they can score. This was a season Jonas, in the, in the turn of the year, shifted Miedemar from nine to ten. May Steena, his lead striker, and it led to this idea of this is this, this partnership. This was a season also where we start the magic of Miedemar was starting to wane. That because I said earlier, she plays this, she played this nine ten combo that worked really well against a lot of the teams, but it was soon becoming clear that this was becoming incompatible. And I remember this so I remember it well. The moment it happened, I think, well, I remember the moment happening because it was at Meadow Park, and it was during Christmas. It was just before Christmas or just after Christmas. We had a game. We were struggling to score in. No, we won that game 4 0. It was a game we were struggling to score, and it it was, it may have even been the Conti Cup game we lost to Manchester United. It might have even been that we lost it 1 0. Sure, it's not Barcelona because we played no, them on the night. No, they were it, was, it, was at, it was at Meadow Park because I remember I was in East Ham watching it. And Arsenal were attacking the, 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 the opposition, and Miedema, as she always does, she comes deep. She comes deep and to assist with the play. We've seen a lot of strikers do this nowadays, and it works very well. But the problem was is that we had no focal point in the box. So me, so the ball was being played around. Me and I come deep for the ball. She'd spread the ball out wide. The wingers overlap from. They whip the cross in. But there's nobody there. There's, now, what worked so well in the past is that uh, me and I had uh, midfield runners, the likes of uh, Van Dijk and Nobbs, to run on beyond me and That's how the assists work. But Arsenal had changed. They were focusing more on the whip with the likes of Beth Mead and Katie McCabe or Nikita Paris, we'd signed that summer. But Arsenal didn't have a focal point in the box. The, the, what made Miedemar so good about being a 9 or 10 had now become our detriment. We now needed either Miedemar to stay in the box, and therefore we would lose our build-up play, the way she could play the ball around in the midfield and, and lose the defenders and pass it on, or she stays there and we bring in a striker. And Jonas went for the other, he went for option two, he brought in Steven Black Seniors. It gave us a focal point. He then he then moved Miedemar to ten. Now this was obviously an in quite I think obviously controversial, um, but it raised a few eyebrows because you are putting the greatest goal scorer ever in in the WSL in a non primary goal scoring position. But this was the way Jonas wanted to play with his high press, high intensity. It was different from the way Joe Montemurro wanted to play. And it and to be fair, it nearly worked. We only missed out on the league by one point. We were, we were close. At one point, we just fell short. But it looked like this maybe was how we would use Miedema going forward, that she would now become a 10. She would become our, our playmaker. And they like sort of Mead, McCabe, if she was playing at the left wing at the time, or um, oh, Cena at top. Yeah. Oh, who? Sorry? Ford on the wing, left wing. Oh, Ford, yes. So oh, Ford, you say Ford, well, yeah. yeah. Ford, Ford, McCabe, Mead, Paris as it was then. Steena up top, that Mead would be sort of the facilitator for these players in attack. Um, but that season ended with her future still in the air. We had a game uh, away at West Ham, last game of the season. I believe yeah. you were there, Matt. Yes, there was and a the, lot of... And the, uh, sorry, Adam, I just, there was a lot of... Uh, we didn't know at the stage, but she, we were expecting her to go. Um, yeah. And it was just one of those things where we thought, if we're going to do it, make sure we do it get the result and I think the biggest yeah. problem was that I think Caitlin Ford was playing up top to begin with and and what happened was Caitlin had to be dragged off at half time so Steena could come on Steph Catley well, comes in and scores a little too late yes. Steena and Steena Catley score but the but the but the battle was lost Chelsea won their game and ultimately it fell through the rumours are you can judge if it's true or not because we chanted we, there was a chance about it the following season that she'd even sign a pre-contract with Barcelona Early that season, that her intention was to leave Arsenal in that season and move on and go and go to another club. Um, but she changed her mind. She remained loyal to the club uh, again, and it was a contract. It was a two one plus one contract, so which became two years, as we'll find out. She gave up the chance to go to Barcelona and and practically, if not win the Champions League, get to a final and have a really good chance. She committed to Arsenal. 
Now, whether that decision was right is to be debated based on how the season played out. Certainly at the time, had Arsenal lost Miedemar, I think it would have devastated the club because she was such an integral part of the team and also such an integral part of the fan base. Just a player that, as everyone knows from women's football, the players, in a lot, for a lot of the fans, the players come before the club. I'm not one of those, I should say. I am a Arsenal club fan. I love the players that play for my club. A lot of fans, they love Arsenal because the player they love plays for them. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. And I love that the players are loved by so many fans. And I think a loss at that point would have been devastating. It still is devastating now, but it would devastated the family would have devastated the team because this team was simply not ready to say goodbye to Miedemar. Maybe Miedemar was thinking about it then, but we weren't ready to lose her. We were in no position to lose her. We were still growing under Jonas. Still reliant, still and reliant on her as well. We were well. exactly. We were still over reliant on Miedemar, if not as an attacker, but as a supplier of goals being the player to, to facilitate the likes of Stina scoring, like Beth Mead. Beth Mead had one of the best seasons of her life that season. It's one of the reasons she, her form took her to winning the Euros with us that, that summer. So it looked like that Miedema was going to be that 10. And just as we sort of got used to that, we were potentially going to lose her. But she committed. She got an improved contract. Um, and there was a lot of press around this. A lot of press. There was a, there was a big interview she did. Um, uh, I remember watching Super Watch her talk about why she's staying and the love she has for the club. There was that announcement at Emirates Stadium when uh, she speaks in Dutch to to the fans. I, I, I forget the, the word exactly, but I think it was something like, I'm ready, are you, or, or something like that. And this was like, wow, we've kept Vivian Miedemar at the club. And I think that excitement ran into the next season, but sadly the Euros happened. And this is one of the key, mom- this is one of the key moments in Decline is a strong word, but it was sort of, if, if it was a snowball, this was the first, or an avalanche, this was the first few sort of rocks tumbling from the top of the mountain. Vivian Miedemar obviously went to the Euros to represent the Netherlands, hosted in England, fantastic tournament, had a great opening game in a one-all um, draw against uh, Sweden, a settled, um, I said, I was going Bramwell Lane, I was there for it. Um, she had a lovely little sort of swivel on, on the touchline, um, played to build an attack forward, and I think it was roared with the equaliser. But then Vivian Medium got COVID and the Netherlands lost her for the remaining two games. And despite being half fit, she played 120 minutes um, as they tried to beat the French um, in the quarterfinals and, uh, and sadly failed and Medium went home. But she, she, wasn't, she, did, she came back to Arsenal the following season, um, not in, I would say, a fully fit state, which had ramifications later on. Obviously, just on this season, was there one memory that you can think of or any other moments that you think of very fondly? It's got to be that Liverpool goal. I mean, I was at home and it was just such a screamer from where I was sitting. I I screamed the house down. It was just insane. Adam, just quickly, any other moments you can think of for the? Well, I, I said I said the the Steve, the Steena goal, obviously, um, but we should also acknowledge um, the goal she scored in Prague to rack up her yeah. fifty goals. Um, the, uh, no, no, Lottie, sorry, that stream at Liverpool yeah, that was this season. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the, so uh, gonna, yeah, yes, we did play the Liverpool FA Cup that season. Green, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm you're going to have to pick another moment. Yeah, you're going to have to pick another memory, Lottie, I'm afraid. So I'm which it's got to be the uh, Slavia Praha game then. There's oh, no yeah, other game to one. pick. Sorry. Right, <laughs> in that case, no, that's fair. I will pick, I need to think about this. I'll think about Sorry, this. Sorry, I did I off screen pick. for a minute. That's why I was a bit like, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's fine. I will go for, ooh, I don't know what good girls have there been. Um, no, I think I'll stick with my, my Stina, uh, the assist for Stina. Just... Just the moment it happened, um, just made your jaw drop. And I think that's what we were all hoping going into that next season. We were all hoping we were going to see that um, uh, that Miedemar in the 10, tearing teams apart from a more withdrawn position, but it wasn't to be. So we go on to the next season. Adam, you've touched on this a little bit as well. I think a lot of the players were 
overused and because they were overused they weren't getting that rest a bit similar to what we've seen post world cup as well if we're honest there's been a, and potentially we might even see that coming next season potentially with what's going to happen with the champions league there's not basically for those that don't don't know essentially the uefa schedule is to decide right okay we're gonna instead of have the month every other month we're gonna have a european qualifier you're going to have it all throughout the summer so you don't really get a break and that's that but with this 22 23 we got the conti cup win we got the, so the semi-finals against wolfsburg managed to get three on the third in the league again limping across that line uh but being knocked out by chelsea in the fifth cup fifth round i think the biggest thing we can say about this season is that um she played a big part in it but for such a little bit of a time because there was times where she said look i look to Jonas, look i need a break yeah. she went and had a break came back for, for a couple of games comes up for the leon home game she goes in for uh to win the ball she loses it she tries to stretch for it and her acl goes so i spoke about the, the start of the avalanche um Meadowbrook came in for the season, all seemed well. Um, I travelled over to um, Amsterdam for a uh, Champions League qualifier. We had to beat Ajax to go through. And Meadowbrook won the game 1-0 for us. An incredible moment. I mean, we're going to get onto memories of Meadowbrook this season. And I think this was it for me. Stormy, rainy, away from home, awful conditions. It wasn't a pretty game, but Meadowbrook found that little spark of magic to score the winner. And... Um, it looked like everything was okay, and then um, we had a game away in Lyon. And I spoke about Arsenal being so reliant on Miedemar, originally as a nine and then as a ten, that she always played. And Miedemar said, pretty much as I started playing football, I have played every game, I play every game. And under Joe Montemuro, we played every, she played every game. And then, and again, every season since. But we went away at Lyon and Jonas opted not to start with Miedema. He left her on the bench, which shocked everyone. Lyon were the reigning champions. We were drawn against the group. This was probably going to be the hardest game of the group, to be honest. And he left, in our eyes, our best player. And he opted to start Frieda the Arts and Mornen in that 10 position instead behind Blackstinius. I don't think any of us could have predicted what followed in probably the finest away performance we've had in European history since we won the Champions League final, the, well, as if known then, the UEFA Women's Cup final in 2007, routing Lyon 5-1, with Frida being a key component playing at the advanced position of our midfield. And it sort of gave, it sort of informed us that Miedemar didn't need to be the answer for every single game that there was a way of playing and playing well and being successful without Vivian Miedemar. Would you say Jonas is well and truly drifted from the way she and her how do I put this her Dutch fluidness? I think that's the best I way think, I can describe her. But I th I think that's absolutely right. Joe Montemuro had a his way of playing was about fluid attack. It was about the, the t getting as many attacking players on the pitch as points. That's why we had uh, Lisa Evans, who was a, an attacking winger, playing at right back. It's why we had Katie McCabe, an attacking winger, playing as left back. Injuries played in the part of that, but it was about over um, overwhelming the opposition um, with with forwards to to create the goal. And Mead was key to that because she was fluid. She could play in a ten. She could play in a nine. She could move about. But that's not how Jonas wants to play. Now you can have a debate about Jonas, whether you agree with him, disagree with him, with his style of play, will it bring Arsenal trophies? Is it sport holding Arsenal back? But at this point, say, this is the way Jonas wants to play. And for Jonas, it's more about the structure to trigger the counter press, to win the turnovers. So the players have their roles in the team to play in specific positions to make that turnover. And Vivian Miedemar is a free spirit. He doesn't play to, to positions. He plays to, you know, into the, into the space to, to move about. It's all about bringing to the build-up, whereas we're more about 
trying to win the, uh, the on the transition, get the turnovers, and then work the ball through the misshapen defence. Gareth is all about structure. That's why we've been so good. We played Chelsea, we played Man City, because our team structure was good. Our off-the-ball work is good. Under Joe Montemurro, it wasn't. And that's why, especially during his later years, we struggled. And I think this Lyon game was a key moment when we started to see Jonas not see Miedema as a necessity in the team to win. Again, you can debate whether he's right or wrong, whether this is a one-off occasion or if this is you know, the beginning of the end. Miedema then takes some time off, and I think she needed it. As she said before, she wasn't right coming out after the Euros. She'd had really bad effects of COVID. She wasn't able to play to her maximum. And when she came back, she looked great. She scored a brilliant goal against Everton at Meadow Park. She scored home and away against Juventus. I was uh, I was there for both. Miedema basically made one well, away at Juventus, not winning the game, but saving the game and then winning the game at the Emirates Stadium. Two key results for us topping the group that season. Um, Got a great goal away at Aston Villa, and it looked like this was it. This was this was Miedemar coming back into fitness, making that turn her position, and this was the start of her, her two years at the club where we were going to see the next the next stage of the Miedemar revolution. But fate had other ideas, sadly, and as you say, Matt, um, in added time, right at the end of the first half, she stretched for a ball, and her knee collapsed. Um, an ACL injury, the worst injury, the injury that's played, had just played, um, Beth Mead had only gone down a bit just a few uh, weeks ago, her home to Manchester United. Um, and that was it. Her season was over. And most of the following season was over. She was forced to watch on as we had to play. We now had, to, we had no choice. We had to play without Vivian Mead. No, we it's something the we had life had about Viv. Absolutely. We, as a team, we had to think, can we be successful without Vivian Mead? Can we win games? Can we win trophies about her? It's something we haven't had to do since 2017 before she arrived. Um, she's become she'd become such an integral part, woven into the fabric of this team, ripped, ripped from us. And now we had to adapt. We had to find new ways of playing, whether it be the back three, the back four, Frieda at 10, or Peter Kim Mithil at 10, Steena leading the line. And to the team's credit and to Jonas's credit, we did. We won the Conti Cup away at Crystal Palace against Chelsea, 3-1, memorable day out, our first trophy since the WSL in 2019. And we didn't need Vivian Miedema to win that final. She was on crutches, watching on, supporting the team. But it was just the start of Arsenal's evolution to the next to the next, the next evolution. Whether you think it's a the right direction or not, it proved that we did... People have this argument that Arsenal must have Miedema to win, but this proved that we didn't. We thought, well, yes, we finished third in the league, but you think we had lost four players to ACLs. We, we were kind of going to struggle to win the league based on that. We thought with Vivian Miedema, we got one more year of her. She extended, obviously, uh, her, her plus one to overcome the ACL injury uh, to recover from it. And then thought, right, next season, we get Miedema back in the team. And yeah, if she can get fit again, and then we're away, and we'll see what happens. I think it's really weird not to say is there a favourite moment, but because of an injury, you can't really say that there's been a moment. You well, my, well, I've said my one. I've said my one, which was the away goal at Ajax, hands down for yeah. me. That was that moment for, for, for that's, me. Yeah, that's personal to me. For me, I would probably say the game against Everton because it was one of those really bizarre games where you thought. We got, we were, I think we were just going on and on, attempting to get a goal and just thought nothing's going to happen. And then Viv just goes and scores a fantastic volley into the, into the um, south. Was, yeah, she, she sort of checked inside and whipped in the top corner. Um, we won the game 1-0. <laughs> Me and my won us the game on, on our own, effectively, like the, like the days of old. It was a superb goal. And I think, I welcome you corrected, but I think that might have, ultimately will be Again, and then she scores. If she plays and scores at the weekend, I think that was her last game at a goal at Meadow Park. But I welcome to be corrected on that one. Lottie, is there any memories that you can think of this for that season? I think I think it's just the the levels of memes I've got out of, out of Viv. <laughs> I think there's one in Meme that. Um, yeah, it's the I think my favourite one I got out of that 
Um, it was the train. I think it was the black and pink army looking training kit, yeah. and she's sitting there pulling faces, and it's just, it's one of them ones where you you see a stupid, well, not necessarily stupid, a very disagreeable opinion on the Arsenal women, and you just you just quote it, and you do that, and you just put Viv there, and it's ugh, everything about Viv is it's it's just. I can't get my head around that she's not going to be there at the minute. So it's it's just it's really difficult, especially to pick a best moment from someone who had a ACL so early in the season. Yeah. And when you're sitting there in the ground, the first I remember sitting there, I was up in the I was in the like that corner between the North Bank and the East Stand in the and when she went down, and I went as soon as she went down, I went that's an ACL. Yeah, and was, a few right days later, I was just like. Team. You just well, can't we to see to play. Um, I was sitting with uh, Lily yeah. and Lucy, and I was just like, "Yeah, that's an ACL." And I, I just yeah. sat there with my head in my hands, and I'm like, oh, "Please, not another one." And unfortunately, it wasn't. It, it was. That was the again. This was the moment when her Barca career sadly was was yeah on the way out. We've had we've had this before. We had uh, Jordan Nobbs. I should say in the past she had. DVD and Jordan Nobbs to play off and it worked so well. DVD went just before Jonas' last season and Jordan Nobbs never, I don't, people again like me, I love Jordan Nobbs and will treasure a lot of the good that she did for the club. But following her ACL, I'm not sure we ever saw that same Jordan Nobbs. That was so brilliant. I think people, when they think of Miedemar, have that view of the Miedemar of 2018-19, the Miedemar of 1920. He was so good and so majestic and so talented and, and so selfless. But I look at what happened after this, and we will talk about the following season a bit, that I don't see that same Miedemar. And if it's not that Miedemar, I, it, it, I, it's, it's sad to see it's not the same Miedemar that, that wowed her so much, but people see that Miedemar every time they look at her. Because they love her so much, and they want they want that Miedema back. They want that Miedema who who wowed us all, and they want that back. But it's time, it's time, and it's fate. And she's she's a different player now. Whether she will be be a successful and brilliant, it's a different um, it's a different Miedema now. And um, sadly, that ACL and um, ended her season. And. Yeah, it, that Leon game, that will stay with me that moment. We lost the game 1-0, but the result was irrelevant. Um, seeing Miedemar lifted off on a stretcher. And we just had to yeah pray for next season and just hope that she would make a recovery. Just remind me, Lottie, as well. There was I, can't, I think there was Jen and Steph were, and Beth, I think, were doing a TikTok in the background in that kit. And Viv's walking past because they're doing it in the gym. She takes one look and sort of just... Looks at the camera and then just sort of walks back out. Yeah, she looks. Oh, I remember right. sending you that because I saw it and I went, "Oh my god, this is hilarious!" I've got to show Matt. So unfortunately, <laughs> our wonderful co-host that's on here with us, it doesn't actually look at TikTok very often. So I sent all, all my stuff <laughs> over to Matt, and I went, "Oh, Matt, you've got I to look, look at this." Just... It was so I... hilarious. I think Matt ended up sending it to you anyway, Adam. But yeah, I, sent I it, am. I, I should it. say, send it to Adam. But he literally, I do keep up on TikTok. She walks around the corner. She's them, and all you see is her back out. And then yeah. again, we got another fantastic meme out of that. Um, and on top of but... the memes, I, you have reminded me, Lottie. There's some classic ones with bibs. Training bibs were Viv's mortal enemy. She could never. It was yeah. all every reason. But just find the photos; they are brilliant. There was also the brilliant picture of her arms crossed, looking very annoyed. Um, she just had this way of just how it wasn't intentional. But she brought so much joy if it was not through her football, but just through her her her, her very being. Um, and we should acknowledge before we, we, we go on to sort of how, how this all played out. Off the pitch, she was as amazing as she were on it. There she has a column um in the Dutch media where she writes yeah. about not just football but about society. She she's you know trying to make a difference in the in the wider world, in the in the world, you know, she's also the patron for War Child. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So this is why I mean, she's not just a credible footballer; she's a credible human being and a very intelligent human being that has to be recognised. Um, always striving for change, trying to improve the game, and trying to improve society. And she's called out a lot about, you know, especially with the world of LGBT, which obviously she's a part of, um, and trying and 
I think if we could all be a bit more like Niedermar in that regards, and just she's she was she was she's such a we say she's a selfless player on the pitch, but she's such a selfless person off it as well, always looking to try and help others over her own. When they had the ACL problem, um, the ACL problem, the ACL injury, sorry, and Miedemar had the ACL injury, and then obviously Lara does hers. What does Miedemar do? She picks up Lara and takes her back to their place so they can look after her and help her through the journey that they have been on. That's just the sort of player Miedemar is. It's such. It's an, an incredible mentality um, to treat your, you know, your teammates, not as your teammates, but as your family. And that's what Miedemar did. Not only that, I always think back to that the Togetherness documentary. I actually yes. think they did a little bit on Victoria Glover when she comes in. She joins them for a little bit in, the, in their place until she's finally settled as well. It just shows you that you kind of need those sort of players in the team to be like, just stay with me until you settled if it's a month if it's two months whatever maybe to the end of the season till you find a place and so be it uh, it's just that document actually that's another point documentary um yeah that that was real good insight i was fortunate enough to go to the um uh the premiere um, they, they put the first, I think it was two or three episodes up, and we got to sit with a and a with Mead and Mead Amar, and uh, I think it was uh, Colin Mewen, uh, or Gary Lewis, one of the Lewins, I forget which one it is, I do apologise. And it was it was great to see them in good spirits. We just, I think we'd just beaten Chelsea 4-1 um, at the Emirates Stadium, and they were all in good spirits. Mead Amar was sort of back in the team, Beth Mead obviously just scored. But you watch the episodes and you watch the journey they're going on and, and the, the, the pain and the suffering, the recovery, but more importantly, you mentioned earlier about the togetherness, the name of the documentary, the togetherness that Mead and Miedema had to help them both go through this journey together, that they weren't alone um, and sort of competing with each other. Obviously, they were on different time timelines of recovery because it occurred different times, but they were still pushing each other and supporting each other and looking after each other. Um, and it just, just again, it further exemplifies just, just what a, not just a player, but what a person she was. And we were, yeah, we were, very, we were very grateful to have her. And we'll just go on to this season now. She's only scored the one goal, that being the goal against Liverpool. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't really say there's been a lot of motivated moments because she's been coming back. She's had injuries left right and centre, coming back. Unless you want to count the Viv and Miles moments. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, this is our sort of last season with us. We are the, now that we know it, it's it's difficult to pick moments. But if I'm honest, I look back to when she came on for yeah, for the Southampton game. You looked at her to say, okay, that's fair enough. You're coming on. You're having a couple of minutes. She didn't seem up to scratch in that game, Adam. No, she didn't, and unfortunately, she didn't seem up to scratch for a lot of the games. And we, we sort of were able to hand wave that because of the ACL recovery. We know Beth meets an exception, but we mm. know most players aren't match sharp the moment they come back from an ACL. Beth, we've, we've, we have been so lucky, Beth Mead, that on the whole, she's hit the ground running. Um, had a few wobbles since, but it's been generally OK. Mead and has been the complete opposite. And it's been awful to see that we just still, after, you know, this, this again, I talked about this two-year contract. This two-year extension that we have when we 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 she pledged loyalty to us and we rewarded her with an, with a really good contract and this is unfortunately what has played out and every time every she came on the subject against uh, later against Bristol City away at Bristol City brilliant one a, a brief moment of medium on magic you thought oh maybe it's still there but it wasn't and she was brought on a sub to try and build up a fitness build up fitness setback after setback for me. The final nail in the coffin for me in terms of Miedemar, in terms of her moment in the team, in terms of her importance in the team, was away at West Ham. And Arsenal were, in the new year, we'd be struggling with no blocks, and Yenis had said, right, well, I am going to combine Russo and Miedemar. They're going to be my 9 and 10. Russo will go, it'll be the lead striker, Miedemar will be in the 10. But the beauty of it is, we know, Russo likes to come deep. So the idea you could have two strikers that could sort of interchange with each other. They could they could be fluid. You could have one take the lead, one play off, and then they could rotate depending on the situation, which is quite which sounds quite good. And he played that for quite a lot of the opening games of the the new year against uh, a home to Everton, the, the FA Cup against Watford, played in the win against Liverpool. Media are getting her goal. Uh, I was biggest of friends and I was, uh, but 
there was a bit of me that thought it reminded me of Jack Wilshere's goal against Chelsea. If you remember when he scores that rocket in 2018, everyone says Jack's back, and then he he's Arsenal career tailed off. That game against West Ham, Arsenal battered West Ham in the first half, but only scored the one goal. And Miedema had moments, moments when she was dancing through the defence, but didn't crucially didn't score. Hit the and crossbar as well. She hit the post. Um, there were some blocks on her shots. The great thing about Miedema is that when she was in her prime in 2018, 2019, she had all the time in the world. She had all the time in the world too. And that's why there's a game away at Liverpool where she scores a goal. It's really worth watching back. She's on the box. She twists, she jinks, she turns. The defenders don't know what they're doing and they all fall on their backside. And then she just dinks the ball over the keeper into the net. It, it's, it's brilliant. You must watch it back. But I don't think you can do that anymore in the WSL. The pace is higher. The talent bar is higher. The defenders are much more aware. And so when you see Miedema running through and she's jinking through, I'm thinking, just take the shot. But that's not Miedema's game. Miedema wants to be absolutely sure. She will take that extra touch. She will make that extra check. And all it does is just allow the defenders to take the ball off her. We were leading at half time. We should have been further ahead. And in the second half, West Ham scored two goals and we lost the game. I don't think we ever saw anything like that from Miedema ever again that season. I think she had further setbacks on her knees. Russo and Steena became the front two. Um, I would say the success of that is probably mixed, but I think it was better than what we were getting with Russo and Miedema, which is a shame because on paper it looked like it could be something rather special. But then I remember there was a game, I think it was at home to Everton, we won it 2-1. There was a moment when they were trying to press. Both Russo and Miedema were both in the same corner hounding the ball. And I'm thinking, that's not right. Your, your, your front two are in one, are all hounded in one position of the pitch. There's nobody in the centre there's, and there's nobody in, well, they should be in the 10. So we've lost any impetus, impetus in the box if they win the ball back. And it was just showing that maybe that wasn't working. But you have to persevere, you have to build up the connections. But then Miedema obviously had the setbacks, she went out the team. We go to the Conti Cup final, we win again. It was uh, Stina and Frida and then obviously Rusa came on after what happened with Frida. And we won the trophy again. And we didn't... and. Again, we didn't need Miedema to win it. And it just sort of further highlighted highlighted that Arsenal can be successful. The league form has obviously suffered. And that's something that maybe we could, if those in the Miedema camp will say, proof of the reason we still need Miedema, our league form has been pants the last few seasons. But we have won trophies. We've won the same amount of trophies now without Vivian Miedema the last two years that we have when we had Miedema during her prime 2017 to obviously 2021. And I felt as the, se- as the season progressed in the second half of the season and the fact that Miedema's contract was up, my feeling was, I just think, I just think we've, we've, we've used that bottle of magic at Arsenal, not to other clubs, but at Arsenal, it felt like we'd, we'd used up all the Miedema magic, all Miedema magic, if you will, that and there comes a point in your time when everything comes to a logical conclusion, whether it be a relationship, whether it be a, a job you're at, you just wake and realise it's been a great run, but I'm just, it's, this is just not, this is just not right anymore. I need something different. It's, you cannot be loyal for it, just pure out of loyalty's sake. You have to have a reason to be there. And I, I, I look at us, I think Miedemar is now going to say goodbye. I think this is the best move for Miedemar at this point. And I think she'll go to another club, could be in the WSL, we may talk on the futures in a minute, go to another club in the WSL, go to all club abroad, and I think she'll flourish. And I think she will greatly benefit from a fresh start, uh, try to move off from this injury nightmare. And I think maybe Arsenal will benefit as well, because from me, from their perspective, this is a player who, again, this is probably quite controversial take, I always believe that no player is bigger than the club, that the club always comes first and the players are part of the club. But the club is the solitary, the, the, the main four. Um, and the problem with the says, their press conference, the questions have always been about Miedemar. It's always been about Miedemar. And I don't think that's fair. Um, but Miedemar is such a player. I don't think we will ever have a, a player of that magnitude again. Um, although it may see what happens to a transfer window. But certainly, um, yeah, this feels like the most logical point to to say goodbye. And I think it's... It's a better point to say goodbye than it was two years ago. 
Um, and so I, I know that the fans have taken this um, not well. And this obviously I, I, I sympathise because I said before, fans love love the players, and she is so loved, and rightly so. She is so loved, she is so adored. As you said, Lottie, she is the reason why a lot of us are Arsenal fans. We wouldn't, Arsenal women fans, rather, we wouldn't be going to the games if it wasn't for the majesty and the magic that she brought to the games. And it is like saying goodbye to a loved one. And, no, and yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. And I say, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was just saying, I say to this, I was just going to say, for me, I say to these things, don't cry that it's over. Smile and celebrate that you got to enjoy seven amazing years of Vivian Miedema. No, I couldn't agree with him more there. I mean, I, I say Viv is the reason why I started watching the Arsenal women, but first and foremost, I am an Arsenal fan. And I always was, I always want the best for the club. And if you've been listening to Viv on BBC Sound, she hasn't, I feel like she hasn't been happy for a while, mostly because of her coming back from injury yeah. and then the reoccurrence. But I just, for me, I just want her to be happy. And, and- and that's all that kind of matters to me because I adore her as a player. But as I said, I'm an Arsenal fan first. I want my club to do well. If people will debate whether, oh, we need me to buy to be successful. I've, I've obviously made my case. You know what? I hate to say it. I've muted her. I've muted her name because I'm sick yeah. of mm. the arguments. Yeah. I, I, I get the arguments. And I think there is a case oh, no, to be made both too. ways. Yeah. But... Oh. People, yeah, people say, "Oh, you'll never replace her. You'll never replace Vivian Miedema because she's such a generational talent, and she is. She is one of the greatest talents ever." But we didn't really know about Vivian Miedema before she arrived. So how do we know that there isn't another generational talent around the corner that we may sign up who may wow us and amaze us as much as Vivian Miedema did? Uh, and my feeling is, of a lot of the players, it's so easy to be sentimental about so many of our players. And that is why our fan base is so amazing, because they, they truly love the players. And I think we sh- that should be celebrated to the heavens. No, absolutely. But there's also the point where people are entitled to their football opinions. Yeah. And people are, are I, entitled I, to ignore them. There is literally yeah. no need for people to put down others for not agreeing with what they think. Or well, let's just add to this as others well. Without offer, offering an opinion. Yeah. There's it's, no it's reason horrible. to be well, going out after uh, after managers, players, uh, yeah, uh, higher ups, or anything like works. that. Uh, yeah, they shouldn't be, and they yeah. think that they're that they're to blame because they we've essentially we've lost a star player at the end of it. Yeah, but as Adam, you put it, you're trying to think logically about it. Does it make sense for her to go now? Yes, because we are two years ago. Were we in a situation to cope? Probably not. And yeah. you look at the squad now, the squad is, I would say it's almost there. It's not 100% yeah. Jonas Satter's factory. I'd probably say it's about 95 because there's a few I'll players. That could I'll go, I would go 80, but I get your sentiment. Okay. Yeah. It is close. But just um, quickly, where would you like to see a, one club that you'd see a, like, like to go to? For me, if I'm honest, I think she might end up at Real Madrid. If if Madrid can offer her the money, oh, that's a call. Cool, that's a shout. Mm. Did you have a quote? Did you have a plan? I don't mind one, so I'll wait. Oh, uh, I think she's going to stay in the WSL. You think because it's going to be yeah. the rumor? No. Yeah, I think it's going to be mm. the rumor. Uh, I mean, Jill okay. Ward's not going to be back for a while, so you know that's a good point. Actually, that's a very good point. Jill Ward's out of an ACL. If, if that's City, the case, I imagine we about. will see movement from Jessica Park moving across to somewhere else. If that was the case, yeah. But so, the, the, the thing is, like anybody to have Vivian Miedemar walk through your doors on a free is just mental, yeah. mental to even think about. Yeah, um, might not be fully fit yet, but it's just mentally insane. It, 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 it does show that how the market still isn't up to date. That star players like her can walk for free. That we haven't built up the economy in women's football to to really give value to the players that they they warrant. Um, I just want to say quickly on on, on the sentiment. All the players we love will move on at some point, and that can be for perfectly amicable reasons. Oh, Whether it be Kim Little, I mean, if me, Leah Velti, we will all say goodbye to everybody. Still not over for Rafael Asiaso. Can't go no, over it. Exactly. Just exactly. Can't. And I and I think yes, this is a rough one. Whether it's the right decision, that's not defined now. People will say it's the wrong decision now. 
it will be defined by what happens over the next few years, what happens to Biedermar's career. People are still bitter that we lost Jordan Nobbs, that we let her go. But I would think now, if we look at how both teams have gone, I would say that's the right call. I think Biedermar will be successful wherever she goes. And my predict- I would like to see her go to Liverpool. Because Biedermar's, I don't know if it's known, but Biedermar is a Liverpool fan. Um, and the rumors, strong rumours are Manchester City. Um, it's been all over the Twitter. A lot of journalists have said that. I can understand the wanting to sign a player like that, and I wouldn't be surprised if you went there. But I think if Liverpool really want to kick on, and they've shown a lot of promise this season, they've, I think they've either secured or are closing in on fourth place. Um, if they want to get back in and, and win the WSL again, they've already got the likes of Shanice van der Sanden, another Dutch player. A lot of talent in that team. They're sort of put together. Matt Beard's a quite a canny manager. A Very player like me, coming team if you're looking for a project mm. you're probably looking at a yeah. Liverpool or Everton um but Everton don't have the money Liverpool have put a lot more of their funding in than Everton have me me Demar took an Arsenal team that was floundering in third place and took him to 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 the title and to trophies again sadly you could argue she's left the t- left the team where she found it but she could do that again I think with another team with a different setup with a setup that would complement her um, complement her style of playing rather than one where she's sort of having to work out how to complement the team. Um, and as I said before, I wish her all the best. This is a decision I felt was coming. I, whether I would have loved her to have stayed, um, but I can, un, whilst the, there might be uproar on social media about the club and the direction and whether this is right or wrong, I sympathise with the call. I can see its logic, I can understand its reasoning. And what it does, sadly, what it now does do is it puts so much pressure on Claire Wheatley, on Eddie Gaspar, and Yuna Seidevel, because this is probably the, one of the biggest gambles they've made um, since they've all been together, this, the, the group and the three of them, because you effectively, in chess terms, you have sacrificed your queen. Um, and now they've got to make sure that whatever next season has to be one of the greatest seasons we've had, has to show that we are in the position to, to do this, because if it's not, if it's another season like this season, then I think the, uh, the, the pitchforks will be out. And if I'm honest, it will be warranted. So we are running out of time on this pod. You can follow us on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Spotify. If you are on YouTube, don't forget to tickle the subscribe button, give a little bit of a hug to the like button. Lottie, where can the magnificent people find you? Um, you can find me at Lottie underscore AWC um, on Twitter and Instagram. Adam, where can the lovely people find you? The lovely people can find me at Adam Salter 4. And if you have enjoyed hearing us talk about Vivian Miedemar for what I think it's been 90 minutes now, and you want to see some of the goals, um, that's the the many goals that she scored for Arsenal down the years. Um, have a check out the Arsenal Women Archive. We're posting clips regularly of seasons past, and I'm pretty sure there'll be some Vivian Miedemar magical moments nestled in there somewhere. You can follow that at the AW Archive. You can also follow the podcast at VAW Pod, or you can follow uh, myself at MattLR28. That is all for tonight. Adam, you did sum it up best but Lottie if there was one thing you could say to Viv what would it be just thank you thank you for making making everyone fall in love with Arsenal women and making us believe it again and you're you're just an Arsenal legend and it won't be forgotten and with that that's all from us thank you and goodbye (laughs) 